have a microphone question for you, I guess, while we're setting up here. Perfect time. Do you put the microphone angled down towards your face or angled up towards your face? I have it angled up towards my face. Okay, what's the reasoning for that? Because then I can see my monitor more clearly. Okay, so it's just about your your field of view. Yeah. All right, okay. I mean, really, the qu- the answer to that question is depends on the microphone you have if you're thinking of, like, what is the optimal way to talk into the microphone, right? Because some microphones, you talk into them directly. Some, you talk into the side. It depends where the actual microphone is within the housing, Right. You know. Okay, so let's let's say you have a sure you have a sure SM58. Are you supposed to talk into that one directly or is that okay to have up or down? How would you even know that? Well, the sure SM58, that's yeah. the one that looks like a vocal microphone, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's easy. You talk into the top of it. But then you get plosives, right? That's the problem. Right, but you're supposed to have a windscreen on it, which I could hear. I heard the little foam. Right. You you heard me adjusting the foam. That's what you yeah. just said. Yeah. So right. that will reduce the plosives. Yeah, but it doesn't. Like, this is what everyone always says. It doesn't. They're like, oh, you, you get a windscreen and a, a thing to put on top of the microphone, and then there's no more plosives. But that's a lie. No that's more. No, no one said no. I didn't say no more, did I? <laughs> I very specifically said reduced. Right? Uh-huh. But the thing is, if you don't talk into the top of the microphone, then you're not talking into the microphone. <laughs> so then you're off mic. Right. I don't know. Like, <laughs> do you know? right? right so like look i can talk into the side of my microphone right now but that's no good is it right because you can't hear me anymore no that doesn't sound good at all so you gotta balance it like yeah there's gonna be a little bit of plosives but like we can manage no but i don't want any i don't i don't want any plosives right so okay so i I was thinking for the well for the okay so the reason i was asking is because i thought when i recorded the audio for the video that just went up Mm. i was like oh my god i have a I have a genius idea instead of talking into the microphone yeah like i see people on youtube and they put the microphone below them or some of them put them it above and i was like uh-huh. oh they must do that so that they don't get plosives they don't have plosives when they do that okay well there's a couple of reasons one because now they're practicing bad microphone technique so like they have to turn up the gain on their audio mm-hmm. right so they can make sure that they get it all in there probably which is going to expose more room noise which is not good for an audio only podcast people are more forgiving of this stuff on video and they're not doing it because of the plosives they're doing it so a microphone is in front of their face because they're filming themselves oh i didn't i, I didn't consider that okay huh. <laughs> That didn't really that didn't really cross my mind. Uh, right. but yes, okay. And everyone's not like, oh, we must eradicate plosives from audio. Let's let's put the microphone on the other side of the room. Yeah, that's what I thought they were doing. No. I guess not. No. It's just so it's not in front of their face. Hmm. There are some microphones where like you kind of talk over them a little bit and that can reduce it. But you've got to then have the right kind of microphone for that. And I'll be honest, I'm not sure what the SM58 is like for that. Now, Mm. I know in the microphone that I own, which is a microphone I know that you bought, but we can never find any evidence of it. Because I didn't buy that. The Neumann (laughs) KMS-105, you are supposed to talk directly into it. So there is a little bit of mic technique that you have to do to try and reduce the plosives, but I'm not going to... Okay, no, but like... By the way, in case people don't know what plosives are, it's it's like, I'm going to remove my windshield so you can hear one. Oh. Peter Piper pick, pick okay. the pick. <laughs> there you go. It's all the purse right, sounds. Now we're, now we're doing this for the show because now you're talking to the audience. I was just asking you about microphone technique. Right, but you see, we're into this conversation, which is now now we've been talking about it for 17 minutes, it feels like. there's Surely it's going to make its way into the show. And we're just talking about plosives, you know, like it's the purse sounds. But by the way, I have a windscreen on now. You hear how much better it is? Peter Piper picked up, right? It's not happening because I have a windscreen <sighs> thing. Yeah, I, I have a windscreen thing too. And I've got the cover on the microphone microphone but it just it never works as advertised i don't mm-hmm. like i feel like the plosives are always really bad mm-hmm. anyway i put the microphone above me pointing down which is now why par- uh, to reduce the plosives that's why mike like, no, but like why did you choose up pointing down i'm just intrigued uh it's it seemed okay so here was my my reasoning for this is like sometimes you breathe through your nose and so if the microphone is below you surely then you're just blowing right on top of the microphone and that mm. must just would be annoying mm-hmm. but if the microphone's above you you shouldn't have that problem have you ever noticed a time where your breath has made its way into a audio recording 
I have. Okay. I mean, it's not like a major problem, but I was just thinking if you pick one way or another, mm-hmm. why not? They, they seem symmetrical. Right. I have a question for you. Uh-huh. Will your new microphone technique do anything to reduce the amount of rustling that you do? Or is that... Rustling? Yeah, I cut so much rustling. What, you what never you heard someone rustle as much as you do. No one else hears it, but there's all this clink clonk. There's little wrappers of some kind doing over there. There's a glass picking up, putting down. You're very rustly. <laughs> rustling? Yeah. Oh, well, I guess I didn't put on my quiet shirt for the podcast recording today. Quiet shirt? Do you have a loud shirt? Yeah, some shirts are louder than others, right? Okay. When you when you move, like the shirt just makes more noise. I mean, I will say I've never heard a shirt. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, then it, then it doesn't matter. No problem. I mean, I'm hearing you fiddling with things on the desk is what I get more of. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I don't fiddle. The last episode was A Thousand Fishermen's Friends, but that one was understood. <laughs> I heard every fisherman's friend being unwrapped and consumed. <laughs> I, th- I saved the Cortexans from this, but I heard it. <laughs> A lot of crunching. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. Well, you know what? Whatever. I shouldn't have brought this up. This is, this is a sensitive topic for you. No, no, no. I feel, I no, it's not like, sensitive. I what I'll like... say is, as far as uh, Gray has a microphone question goes, this is uh-huh. one of the nicer ones for me. Okay. <laughs> because you're not doing anything wild. It's not like, hey, I unplugged my microphone. Is that good? <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> this is, That's unfair, this is fine what you're asking me. Okay. I go down pointing up just because I find that to be more comfortable because also... I kind of would then point my face down towards the microphone to talk into the microphone rather than pointing it up to talk into the microphone. Oh, interesting point. That's an interesting point so there. I find that to be more comfortable. Mm, I hadn't thought about that. The problem for me is I just never really think about the microphones until this moment. When, no, I know. <laughs> when we start recording the yeah. show, yeah, yeah, yeah. suddenly I Everyone actually, my, my brain starts articulating the actual questions. <laughs> Whereas before, I'm just Talking like... Talking about this, I have a piece of follow-up for you <laughs> Okay. that I heard in editing the show. It didn't clock for me the first time, and I had some Cortexans mention it. Mm-hmm. But there's a moment in the last episode where you talk about how nice it would be to have a fixed audio environment for the videos. Mm-hmm. Will you ever grace me with the same? Um, <laughs> You're like, oh, it'd be so great. It would be so great if the videos, all of the audio sounded the same. <laughs> I, have an, I have an unchangeable audio setup, <laughs> right? Where like I have tape on the floor so it sounds the same. <laughs> Will uh-huh. I ever get given that treat? Oh no! So look, I know I know how this sounds, right? <laughs> I know how I know how this comes across. Okay, let me, let me explain my position here. Yeah, is good luck. The, the problem with Cortex yeah. is that it's a podcast. Oh, that's a problem. So the the issue here is that we're recording on a computer over uh-huh. a long period of time. Uh-huh. Like it's a, it's a very different setup. When I'm envisioning like, oh, I would like to have a setup where I can have my video audio be the same every time, you don't have to record into a computer, right? Like you can use one of the road things to just do a direct recording on there. And then you can have a totally different setup. But why does it need to be a different setup? Why don't you just have one recording setup? <laughs> no, because like just just by the fact that we're we're sit like we're on the computer. Okay, so uh-huh. the software changes all of the time. Software. We, we sit here for five hours in an afternoon and uh-huh. are talking to each other and recording the show so during that time you move around there's you rustle a bunch right like you're moving back and forth from <laughs> the microphone some fisherman's friends right you eat some fisherman's friends you, you crack your seat so uh-huh. it can you can lay back and relax Turn on and off the dehumidifier or whatever that beeping sound is. You know? <laughs> I was trying to do that so that you wouldn't notice because I had forgotten. <laughs> yes, you turn on and oh, I didn't off hear it the then. various things. I don't know if you did it then, but I didn't hear it then. I just hear it in general. Because yeah, this no. is the funny thing of like all of these noises, I don't hear them because Skype compre- like Skype does like the audio compression, right? I right. only hear them later. Yeah. I don't know all the, the shenanigans you're getting up to when we're talking. It's later on. Uh, okay, right. Yes, Skype compresses them away. So yeah. anyway, it's like, just look, recording the podcast is just oh, a more variable environment. Uh-huh. <laughs> what are you doing? Like, just... <laughs> but here's the thing, doesn't need to be, right? But, like my, my environment, very uh, static. Mm-hmm. I have a recording desk, microphone, everything stays the same. Mm-hmm. So it can happen. Yeah. Uh, but look. 
distance from the microphone is the number one factor, right? Like that's yes. that's the big issue that just simply cannot stay the same when you're recording a podcast for forever. So look, here's here's uh-huh. here's my pitch to you. Right. If I'm ever able to get an office where I work outside of the house, which seems increasingly unlikely with every passing day. No, no, we can do this. <laughs> right? And Within that office, I'm able to set up just a little corner where I can keep the audio the same every time for when I record the videos. Just like, don't touch anything. Uh-huh. That means when I come back and I'm doing the the podcasts from my home, it's more likely that I'm not going to mess with anything here because I don't need to change any of the settings or the way that I have everything set up for the video versus the podcast. Like you just can't keep those settings the same. It just doesn't work. And so I have to change them back and forth each time. And so if I had a dedicated place to record the audio for the video, I would have to change less about the Cortex setup. Okay. This would be in your favor in the long run. I'm not stopping you. <laughs> I encourage I just, it. I feel, I feel like, Mike, I feel like you make me sound like a crazy person whenever we have these conversations. Me. Like, it seems very yeah. reasonable to me, but you're somehow framing mm-hmm. me as though I'm the lunatic here. No, you're right. It is me. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, no, it's definitely me that does that. Why, if you had an office, do you think you'd record the podcast at home? It's more comfy. Right. This podcast is an all day affair. Yes. So I feel like this is just a better environment for recording the podcast. I don't have opinions one way or whatever. I was just Mm. just intrigued by that. Because when you had an office before, you were never there when we recorded, were you? No, never. I've yeah. I've always recorded the podcast from home. I mean, okay, that's not literally true, but it's basically true. Yeah. I mean, you've recorded from hotel rooms all over the planet, as have I. But mm-hmm. like, I I couldn't remember. Because mm-hmm. I I remember when you're in the glass cube. Obviously, we'd never do it because that was just like an audio hell. Yeah. Man, I just had a flashback to that uh-huh. guy with the whiteboard. The guy with the whiteboard. Yeah, there used to be a guy next to you who had a whiteboard and it had a bunch of words on it. Oh, right. Did yes, we talk course, about this yeah. on the show? I'm, I'm confident we did. Yes, I'm, I'm fairly sure that we he did. He had like uh, a lot of buzzwords on a whiteboard and you were trying yeah. to work out what his, get, what his deal was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, It's so, oh, always fun in a cube farm to figure out what all the other uh-huh. cubies are up to. Mm-hmm. But you don't want them figuring out what you're up to. No, so. that, I can work <laughs> them out. I don't want them to work me out. <laughs> but yeah, so I don't know. Recording the podcast at home, it's just, it's such a long affair. It feels like it makes much more sense and it's much more comfortable just to do from home. Okay. Again, part of the reason I really want the office outside of the home is as a like a dedicated production environment and that is lean towards video. So it's like it's just so much better if I go here, I work on the videos, I do everything about that, and then I leave and mm. do other things elsewhere. I understand that. In the meantime, I'm going to experiment during this podcast with nope. flipping the microphone <sighs> from pointing down to pointing mm-hmm. up. And you let me know if you notice a difference. Talking about audio, I just wanted to mention this. No one got in touch with me. It was like a little uh, secret last episode. Mm -hmm. We were talking about ADR, Mm -hmm. which is when in TV shows and movies, people add lines in after the fact. I ADR'd a line about ADR into the last episode. So when I was editing, I recorded a new line and edited it in. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I did a purposeful job of making it not sound like me then Mm -hmm. the way that i did that was i wrote out what i said and then read it back using my bad acting skills Mm -hmm. so i could hear it not one person wrote in to tell me that they spotted it so i just want to put that out there (laughs) there was a treasure hunt in the last episode and nobody found the prize well i think you're you're underrating your acting and adring skills because i think you did a good job of matching Uh, see i purposely didn't match it like i I I have done matching like uh-huh. I have done that and 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 consider it like successful, but I purposefully made it not sound right. I feel like yeah, I think you you have some advantages that film sets really don't. Like film sets have a lot working against them for any ADR stuff. I should have recorded it in the bathroom, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, put that in there. No, because if it's going to, if you're going to do podcasting ADR, it would have to be the reverse, right? Because What's happening in movies is they're using on-set audio uh-huh. for their dialogue, and then they have to record in a booth to do the ADR. Uh-huh. So you should have had to be like performing a stunt while delivering that dialogue, <laughs> and then mixed like, it back in. Okay, right. like putting a car on two wheels. Yeah, I, th- I think people would have noticed it more if that was the case. If if you were, you know, performing stunts, or just literally just outside, right? One of the other big like 
ways audio just sounds different as if you're outside. But yeah, nobody wrote in and noticed. I didn't even notice That's when true. I was editing the show. And I also had the advantage of knowing that you were going yeah. to do that. Right? Also, the <laughs> section of the audio in Logic said mm -hmm. Mike ADR. Right, yes. Line. So, like, <laughs> you could have seen it. I mean, you probably weren't looking at uh, yeah. the audio while you're listening to it, but, you know, you could have been. Yes, I 100% was not looking at the audio. I was playing Game of Magic, which is what I always do. I wished I could do stuff like that, but I can't because I'm hands-on, right? Yeah, and you're doing the first pass, which yeah. is, yeah, you have to be Because I, I have to be, I'm cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting, and cutting yeah, forever. Mm -hmm. And I know that, like, really, your job is to listen. Mm -hmm. And I know you make tweaks and, you know, every now and then, but like, I would assume that you could go 10, 15 minutes without touching it. Yeah. Ideally, that's what should be happening. Yeah. 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 If I've done a good job. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not looking at it. And it was only when the show came to the end, I was like, Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> he played, right. I know he put some ADR. And so I just, I, I found it by visually looking at the file and I was like, there you are extra piece of audio. Because this is an audio show. I will cut that in now so you can hear it. So people can mm. see now that you know, it's there listeners. Can you hear it? Is the the question. But like I don't know what it is. I think that maybe it's just something like if you're used to dealing with audio and like the, like piecing together the way people speak, it truly is incredible how hard it is to try and make something match. It takes a lot of work to try and get that right and yeah. a lot of skill in controlling your own voice. Mm -hmm. Don't train people to listen for ADR. It's nothing but a curse. That's true. You know, it's like teaching people about typography. You're not doing mm. anyone a favor by like, oh, here's here's how to correctly kern letters. Yeah, like, I'm not a fan of the kerning. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like don't don't show people that. It's not a font. <laughs> it's a typeface. <laughs> There's so many things like that in life where it's like, oh. Why did you teach me to appreciate this difference? Mm -hmm. like, now, I, now I can just be annoyed at a thing I never cared about before. Congratulations on your return to YouTube. Oh, thanks. Yes. What took the extra time in the end, by the way? Because when we spoke mm -hmm. on the episode, you were like, I'm ready to go, baby, any day now. And it was like <laughs> another week. It felt like that. I might have ADR'd a bunch of lines. <laughs> 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 Fair enough. I completely re-recorded the entire back third of that video, which is the whole physics section. Right, right. And then there were a bunch of other lines that I did do much more ADR-like of, okay, I'm going to try to cut this in. And hopefully it doesn't sound too terrible. So... Yes, I was hoping not to do that, but as I came closer and closer to releasing it, I thought there was just enough of it that I wasn't happy with. Right. You only work on these videos for a certain amount of time, but then you have to live with them for eternity in the, in the way that they go up. And I thought, I've spent months on this thing. I'm going to take the extra week and do this. It's always really hard to make the decisions about when to stop like it's not obvious when you passed a point of real diminishing returns mm -hmm. and so i think i had kind of talked myself into the idea that i was past the point of diminishing returns but i was actually wrong like this is one case where it's like no no it was the right decision to re-record a bunch of it and also spend all of the effort to fix and tighten up and tweak some of the lines in the first two-thirds so i'm very glad i took that time because I'm much happier with the video that went up versus where it was at the time that we recorded. It would have been fine, but there's something really satisfying about tightening things up, tweaking it all together, and then be like, aha, like now this thing is much better put together than it was previously. So mm. that's why it ended up taking an additional week. It's, it's like, oh, I am going to re-record this. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I think that that was the right call, right? Because like, so I think something we were talking about was you didn't really want to peg this to be the, oh, that's when I had COVID video. Mm -hmm. So like, oh, you're a horse. You're a horse. You're a horse. <laughs> you know, like you, you don't want that to come across in the in the video. And also like, I mean, I, you can tell me how I'm wrong, but it seems like it is doing very, very well. Yeah, it's doing really well. The thing that's interesting about it is it's, so just for anyone listening out of time, this is the runway video. That's the kind of like three in one video. The simple secret of runway digit yeah. is what it's currently called. <laughs> As so right I didn't now. say the title. Who knows what it's going to be called <laughs> years from now. It's YouTube, like, baby. <laughs> yeah. The topic is runways uh -huh. uh, and it's a three in one video. Mm -hmm. And it has a, it has a unique uh, eight letter identifier in the YouTube URL. And that has how it's referred to. But 
Yeah, it, it is doing very well. I would say the thing that's interesting is it's following the same pattern that the Tiffany 2 video did, the sort of follow-up to the Tale of Tiffany, which is that it is doing very well, asterisk, the the audience is extremely lopsided to pre-existing viewers and subscribers, which is not bad. Like, I'm not complaining about that, but I would prefer to see that there were more new people being brought okay. in. So it's doing well, but I can see on the back end, it's like, okay, this is almost entirely YouTube recommending this to my existing viewers, which oh. I think... Given the fact that it's a, it is a 17 minute video about runways is not wildly surprising that that might be a hard sell to someone who doesn't already know the channel. Like, yep, this guy made a 17 minute video about runways. Yeah. Are you interested in watching? I think most viewers would go, not really. No, <laughs> it's different to plane boarding video. Yeah, exactly. But. So here's my, I guess what I'd say is how did, the, how is this one faring in this regard to the interstate highway numbering video? Because these feel akin to me. Do you mean just in terms of like how many views is it doing? Well, like in that, that breakup that you, the, like the makeup you're talking about of like existing subscribers oh. and like how is it performing against that video? Yeah, yeah. So basically, like as far as I can tell, pretty much day one, YouTube is almost exclusively showing it to your own viewers. And I think YouTube is just using that as a test to see, oh, like how well is this video doing with people who already like this content? Mm -hmm. And then only from day two do you start to see, okay, is YouTube pushing this to new people or not? And I think with, with videos, what I want to see and what the interstate video had is that the ratio of existing viewers to new viewers is approaching but never quite reaching 50 50 so it's maybe like 60 percent of the views are your subscribers and 40 percent are new viewers but videos like tiffany 2 and this one the ratio is a lot closer to something like 90 10 right where 90 percent of the views are coming from existing viewers and 10 percent is new viewers so that's, uh, I didn't check this morning what the video was doing, but last time I looked, it was a lot closer to the 90-10 end of the spectrum than the 50-50 end of the spectrum. Which the interstate video had more, was closer to the 50 Yeah, I, th I feel like interstate video, again, I'd have to oh. double check, but I feel like that was doing 60-40 a few days afterward. Which also, I feel like is not surprising topic-wise. It's in the same way that like when that Tiffany follow-up video came out, I was very like, oh, you know, I don't think this is going to do very well because it's a follow up. And then like there's a funny thing if people are just looking at the view numbers, which is that the follow up video has more views than the original. It's crushed it, not just more. It's like it's, you know, one at some point will be double, right? Like it, it's a big surprise. Yeah. At some point it's going to be double. But on the back end, if there is a funny way in which the first video is much more successful at bringing in people who didn't know about the channel. But that which, makes sense yeah. to me, though, yeah, because yeah, yeah. That's, that follow-up video is referential, like, mm -hmm. and it's very personal, I think, in a way that it doesn't necessarily make sense. It's like, this is how, it's a behind the scenes, like, this is how mm -hmm. I made that video. Yeah. But then you, you get into the, well, then more people have seen the video just the behind the scenes than the actual video. Like, I still don't understand how that's possible. Like, I don't know how someone could come to that video and then not watch the, like, be like, oh, I should watch the original first. Like, I should watch the video this is referencing. Like, it's such a funny thing to me, but it is what it is. I think it makes a lot more sense when you realize that the vast majority of people are just watching whatever YouTube happens to recommend to them. Oh, and for so, sure, like, for sure. if you really internalize what does that mean, that then I think this scenario makes way more sense because if you think about it, the Tiffany video might be less interesting to the average subscriber, but the follow-up video might be way more interesting to the average subscriber. Okay. And so then if you think about if YouTube is just recommending stuff to people and most people are just following YouTube's recommendations, that pattern actually makes sense if the Tiffany video is less interesting to people who are already subscribed. So it is not likely to be recommended compared to something else after someone has finished watching Tiffany too. So, so that's why like I find that that pattern less surprising than it initially seems. And the breakdown of like new subscribers versus existing ones, 
lines up with exactly what I would expect with that one. Okay. So as of right now, I would just say that the runway video is doing great. I am both extremely happy and extremely relieved that it is doing as well as it is doing. I just think I didn't necessarily think that it might break in this way of like for existing viewers only in the same way that Tiffany too did. So that that's just something interesting I didn't think about at the time, but in retrospect makes a lot of sense. Do you think that there is like a pent up demand kind of feeling? The existing viewership, they're like, oh my God, there's a new gray video. Yes, for sure. There's definitely got to be a pent up demand effect. The thing that is good though, is that I can see that their retention is still pretty high on I was a long video ask. like this. Yeah. So, so that's, that's the main thing is like, ooh, is the retention worse on something like this compared to other things that would be an indicator it's like ooh, pent up demand but also not being satisfied pent up demand right. it would be if the watch time was not as good but this is the whole reason why i think youtube is actually recommending it to a bunch of my subscribers is because there is a pent up demand people are clicking on it probably because of that and then they are staying a long time and they're interested. And so YouTube is then amplifying that effect of like, okay, this actually is something that his existing subscribers want to watch and they want to watch it to the end. So yeah. that, that's where it's kind of hitting all those points. I've become much more or I've paid more attention to a lot of this stuff in the past year, looking at how videos are doing in a bunch of different ways mm -hmm. and... Part of that is kind of related to my theme of like new decades dawn of if I want to be doing this for a long period of time, I have to like think about it in a different way than mm -hmm. I have previously. And so, yeah, I feel like I've just been digging into the details more with statistics on videos and seeing what's happening. How does this compare to other stuff? What's different? What's working? What's not? You can, you know, one can never know the actual mind of the algorithm, but you can try to see some patterns and try to bin different videos in different places in your mind. Yep. And this then gets put into the category of like, oh, this is a, a video that's really solid for existing viewers. There's a funny counter example, which we talked about maybe it was half a year ago when it came out where I did that Tesla video about the most deadly road in America. Yep. That one is the, the flip case where that video was my worst video on release by a lot. Like it was just tanking. And the reason there was is like, oh, YouTube showing it to existing viewers. It's different for a bunch of reasons that I totally can see in retrospect and like existing subscribers did not love that video. So YouTube was really hesitant to recommend it to right. anyone. But it's been slowly creeping up over time. And it's like, oh, I can see that YouTube is actually slowly finding the new viewers who are interested in that. So like that one has flip statistics. It's like almost all of the views come from people who have never seen the channel before. And it's been ever so slowly picking up steam, but it's just, it's interesting to see as a counter example of like, oh, okay, that's the opposite effect. And it's also a little bit heartening just to know that if you try something that's different, but some people like it, YouTube may be able to eventually find the people who are interested in that thing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, for like a, basically like a vlog style video, I'm pretty happy with where that is now even though it was real depressing <laughs> the first uh, week that that one came out. That was awful. Because <laughs> that was also a gap, right? There was a big gap. Not like as big, but there was quite a gap between that and the prior video. Again, there's many things about this job that are weird that people might not think about, but the <sighs> having gaps in your upload schedule is a is a kind of pressure that I think a lot of people would deal very poorly with and you know I've, I've been on both sides of that like with the tesla video that was real bad when it wasn't doing well and there had been a gap and this is the flip side where it's like okay there's been a the longest gap ever huh. i am really happy that it is being very well received among my subscribers there's just such a deep unpleasantness in that feeling as an upload gap grows longer and longer you know that there's this implicit audience expectation that you're going to come back with something bigger and bigger. 
Yeah. That's not always the case, guys. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. It's like, next one's going to be a banger. Yes, exactly. I always feel... Like, obviously, I, I feel for you in these moments, but I really feel for the YouTubers who they have huge gaps and their videos are like three hours long. Oh, I know. Yeah. Right. And that just, uh, uh, that feels so horrible to me to imagine like how something like that, to put something like that together must be mm -hmm. so immense. I mean, I assume, I will, like, I'm not just saying because you're here. I assume mm. that you have a somewhat similar, because it's the animation, right? Animation takes a really long time. Um, so there is definitely some of that there for you too. But like you see, you know, people come and they're like, they've got these really nicely well-produced, well-written, mm. well-researched videos that are like three hours long and they release a few of them a year. I mean, if you just chose the wrong topic, oh man, that feels... Ugh. I just want to clarify here. The holdup is always on the writing end. Yes, we spend a ton of time on the animation, mm -hmm. but if but if you're looking at like what causes the delay, it's like a 95% of it is me writing. Like that's what causes the delay on this end. But yeah, what you mentioned there is I, I found it like it's an interesting phenomenon that over the years there's in a way that I think could never have existed before there are an increasingly large number of channels that do that thing that you've right. just mentioned. Okay, I'm pleased you said this because I feel like I'm seeing more of it, but I just thought that that might just be like a no. It's it is a not you. I'm seeing okay. no way. Like it's it's not a it's not just you. It's totally a thing that exists. The reason I've really tuned into it is I think that I used to be a real statistical outlier in terms of the rarity of upload, but now. There are a lot of channels that upload way less frequently than I do. Yeah. And like it it makes me stressed out even just to think about that. It's it's the pressure of that is unbelievable. Like you said, if you pick wrong two out of three times, which is very easy to do, yep. like it's un it's unbearable the amount of pressure that's there i don't know the exact reason for this phenomenon but i think of this a lot like there are channels that are realizing you can basically be a small team who makes an episode of tv or a movie all on your own mm -hmm. in the course of many months like that's basically what they're doing i actually have a theory for why i think this is changing why membership patreon that kind of support the direct support mm -hmm. because you know these are creators that would like to make long documentary style pieces but the U youtube's payment system doesn't really want you to do that mm -hmm. right like the way that money works on youtube benefits someone who produces lots of small videos on a frequent scale because mm -hmm. then the more inventory you have for people to watch the more money you can make the more likely you are to be able to turn this into a living right because just the, all of the numbers just keep going up over time and the more videos you make the more incremental views you get on all of them right and it can and then youtube that sense can start to make sense for you but if you do if you have like a patreon model which like the one that you switch to of like there will be a monthly support whether or not there's a video and like you're asking people to come along on that journey with you right and there's like a bunch of youtubers that i support that way it allows you to take the time where if you to to work on larger projects because you couldn't do that every month like no one could make like two hour videos every month to either a support the pay me when uploads go or b the youtube system of just like keep feeding this content so I think as I feel like I'm seeing more and more creators now doing the monthly support thing and saying kind of like, if you really like what I'm doing here, you know there's going to be more. Like, will you support this? Mm -hmm. And then it allows them to go ahead and make these videos and it doesn't matter what YouTube think of them. Uh, yeah, I think, you, I think you have a point there about just the financial structure that needs to exist mm -hmm. in order for that to happen. I do think embedded sponsorships are a big part of that because I can also think of very few channels, can really only think of one that has this model and also still doesn't have embedded sponsorships. But even that though, if you're only doing one video a year, 
or like three videos a year, four videos a year, and you're selling the sponsorships up front. Admittedly, I don't know how this works on YouTube. Like, it doesn't matter how big the video... Like, you could tell me the answer to this question, maybe. For embedded ads on YouTube, by and large, is the practice that you set the price beforehand? Yeah. And it's yeah, a fixed that's, price? Yeah, that's how. that's usually how it works. Right, so then it's like... It, if the video blows up, it doesn't make a difference to you because you have to have given a number that you're confident you're going to hit. So, like, yes, it helps, but if you're if you're doing this like three videos a year and they're mammoth in length, I still think that the that the monthly support's going to make the actual difference. This is to me what is the the unbelievable pressure of those kinds of things is. Because subscribers are not really your own on YouTube and it's entirely about what YouTube recommends, you can just whiff on a video in a major way at any moment, uh -huh. right? And like that is the horrifying thing about doing this and having a big gap where you then upload a, a really long video. I just think like there is just a fundamental rule that or not, not a fundamental rule, but I think it's a very good guideline that advertisers in general outbid direct support through things like Patreon. Like mm -hmm. they just pay more. So that's why I think it really is a critical factor that, that these channels that do really long things really far apart, they have to have the embedded sponsorship almost <sighs> like near universally. I'm going to challenge one point on that. And you could, I mean, again, you know more than me about this specific world, right? Uh -huh. If you have a creator who has a Patreon and that Patreon gives them money every month, whether or not there's a video, and they release four videos in a calendar year, would the sponsorship outweigh the full total of the Patreon if their Patreon is really successful? Mike, I'm going to say yes. Like, All right. yeah. Cool. Right. I, mean, that, <laughs> I mean, look, here's the, here's the thing, right? If the video is going to hit a million, and if they're confident they're hitting, they're going to hit a million, then yes, of course. But mm. you have to be very confident in that, right? Yeah, and that's that's what the pressure is. Because if you don't, you're not going to get the money. <laughs> yeah, that's going to cause a lot of problems. Right. So that this is kind of so. My assumption would be, if you're a YouTuber and you're a smart one, you're leaving a lot of money on the table when it comes to sponsorship. Because if your video blows up, you don't get more money for it, right? So you have to like bet it at a level which you're confident you're going to hit. And for most YouTubers, that I'm confident I'm going to hit number will a lot of the time for popular ones be significantly less. Mm -hmm. Do you have a I'm confident I'm going to hit number? No, like I, I right, don't. Because you don't need to think about it anymore. So, but what we're what we're talking about right here, mm -hmm. like this is a big part of the reason why I stopped doing the embedded sponsorships mm -hmm. is because I just found it so incredibly stressful. And right. It's like I hated it. It made me so miserable. It it really did. And this is why I'm assuming that for a lot of people, I would expect that the Patreon is making a a, a huge difference in that because you actually can feel like you've got some some kind of level of bankable income to support you through that process. And like, yeah, you can make a lot of money on the ad side, but that comes with a, a lot of increased pressure if you want to try and make the money you quote unquote should make. Membership and Patreon, that supplies reliability. Yeah. Right. Embedded sponsorships provide more income but at like a cost of greater variability uh -huh. and wildly increased stress like i think that that's basically what the situation is there and like people might say like mike isn't this just what you do right and the answer is yes but no yeah yes but no not at all yeah because yes we sell sponsorships and at the moment our sponsorships are more lucrative than our membership however i don't know how that's going to change in the future because membership continues to creep up, say for this show, in a way that our ad rates don't. Mm -hmm. And part of that is because like we set an ad rate, an amount of money that we go out to sponsors and like say this is how much it's going to cost and this is how many people listen. And that how many people listen number is set at a significantly lower number than we actually tend to hit because there is variability, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not a massive difference, but there is variability. But the one of the differences between podcasts and YouTube is like, if you subscribe, you probably listen mm -hmm. and the numbers show. But all we get is like, we don't know how many subscribers we have, right? We know how many people 
by some kind of level of approximation, have pressed play. Yes. Yeah. And that's all you get. Where, and that's very different to YouTube, right? Where like you get that in the how many people have viewed, but you also have a subscriber number. And so like you've got these two numbers, you can't really work out what to sell on maybe, I don't know. But we don't have that part. But the variability is way lower. Like yeah. podcast episodes don't blow up. They don't go viral by and large. Yeah, and the variance is just lower, which makes the job of selling a sponsorship so much easier but it's much more yeah. comforting and also if an episode does like have a big difference the amount of big difference it has is not so large that you feel like oh man i left so much money on the table here right it's i, I think i would summarize it this way if you took an average podcast episode and and then you say oh what's the best episode we did in the year and what's the worst episode we did in a year the best episode might be 20 percent more than the average episode and the worst episode might be 20 percent less than the average episode yeah on youtube that number is 20 times yeah. right so like you take the average one and like the best one can be 20 times as much yeah and the worst one can be a 20th of the average number like it's, there is it's a funny nuts. thing where like me and you we had like we we actually did have a funny thing like this today where we were yeah. looking through some stats of the show and realized that there was an episode that significantly outpaced other episodes and we were surprised by it but the difference as you say it was a little bit larger than normal it was about 30 percent but like it wasn't like oh my god we've made a terrible mistake kind of thing yeah. right so it's it, it is true right but like if we were looking at that like oh my God, this is a huge difference level on YouTube, it would be just by the nature of the platform for us to say like, this is a huge difference. Most likely it's going to be a very big number. Mm -hmm. As an actual viewer, I really like that there's this kind of outlier content of someone's going to go away and then they're going to come back with a three hour long video about a thing or they're, they're going to come back with just like a crazy in-depth video about a particular topic. I really like that that stuff exists. But the content creator in me can never not look at that and just be absolutely horrified. I mean, I respect the game, right? <laughs> yeah. Because I know I couldn't play it. Also, from my perspective, it's kind of more relieving to see people playing in some ways like a higher stakes game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, like, I'm going to pop oof. him in my 18-minute animation and I'm rolling the dice on it. Like, you good luck on your, like, four-hour video. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's interesting to see that kind of thing happen. And uh, also, just because I think people always get weird ideas in their head about how YouTube works and and like the meme of watch time is really in some people's minds. It's like, guys, I guarantee you, even these channels, they're doing really long things. They're not like on the YouTube side coming out like bandits because what YouTube still wants is lots of videos frequently. I even saw this on, on my own recent video where people were leaving comments of like, oh yeah, it's it's Gray's playing the watch time game. It totally makes sense to upload like a really long video every once in a while. I was like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> Trust me. It doesn't. Yeah, it's like, I guess on that, right? Like, and, and this is a terrible example, but like how much better our animated videos and the Cortex channel do than the podcast videos. Oh yeah. Right. Hugely better. Because people want short videos. Yes. Exactly. And I know that there's like a million reasons, right? That like the of course the animations are more engaging than just like the static screen of the audio of the show playing. Like I hear mm -hmm. that. But like YouTube also serves them and like it, yeah, sm short videos, that's what the system wants now, right? But but as you say, there was a time where watch time was the thing. But yeah. it, and it's kind of grabbed its hold on people and they haven't let go of it. Like people think it's it, that's what the algorithm wants. Yeah, it, it exists in people's mind. Again, watch time is very important, but I think this meme got in people's heads when YouTube first rolled this out and clearly had overtuned the system to recommend stuff purely based on watch time. Mm -hmm. And they, like they've pulled that back. And I think and again, people can complain about the algorithm a lot. I certainly do. I still think watch time is actually quite a good metric, all things considered. It's just funny how people have it in their head whenever you release a long video. It's like, oh, he's doing that to play the algorithm game. It's like, I guarantee to you whoever you're watching who just released a 90 minute video they're not playing the algorithm like that's no, a they terrible are rolling game. the dice yeah they, they, the only game they're playing with the algorithm is russian roulette like that is the game they're playing because the longer your video right the higher the risk you're playing for retention 
Mm-hmm. Which is another very important statistic. Because mm-hmm. if people stick through for the entire video, well, that shows that the video is engaging the entire time. Like, that's got to mm-hmm. be an indication to the algorithm of, like, hey, yeah, this is a good one. If you've got a video that's like three hours long, you're way increasing the ability for people to bail on it. Every second the, the viewer is watching is an opportunity for them to bail because they've <laughs> lost interest. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Every single second. It's very interesting because Mr. Beast has a lot of stuff where he's talked publicly about this. You know, the at the time of recording, I mean, you can basically say he's the most popular YouTuber. He doesn't have the most subscribers, but he gets he's got to be pulling in the most he- views it does right? i think it doesn't matter the numbers i don't think matter i think that's obvious right in, in subscribers mm-hmm. subscribers is a nothing number yeah because we spoke about this right like it doesn't matter how many subscribers you have just the views you have but mm-hmm. mr beast is like the youtuber right yeah like that this person changes every now and again right mm-hmm. now it's mr beast yeah but I, I think one of the things that's key about his success if you watch his videos like and i will admit it took me a little while to kind of get what he was doing like i, I watched some of his videos and i thought like I don't, i'm totally not interested in this but i kind of forced myself to keep watching them i thought oh, okay at some point it clicked and like ah i get it but he is the king of maximizing watch time while giving the viewer the the fewest possible reasons to click away and his stuff tends to be in the like 10 to 20 minute range mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of his videos and i i feel like intentionally or unintentionally he's really min maxed what is possible here and i feel I like don't that think it's unintentionally everything i've heard and seen about him i don't think anything he does in it is unintentional yeah so i i, I meant on this is really i meant unintentionally in the way of like he's the right person at the right time not right. like not that he is being undeliberate in the in the video because it seems like he is really turned maximizing for the algorithm into an art form yes yeah yeah but like so what i mean by unintentional is just like there existed an ecological niche that was waiting to be filled we yeah. just didn't know that right yeah. and he came along and he's he's completely filled it mm-hmm. but if you watch his stuff if you listen to him talk about the editing yeah he's he's just being really good at like Give them a reason to get to the end. Don't give them any reason to click away. And he accomplishes that very well in his videos. But the, again, like I think the fact that they rarely go over 20 minutes, I, mean, I feel like he's got some in the 30 minute range. But again, we're getting to like very few. That is also why I really respect the channels that try to do something for like an hour or yep. two hours on a topic. Because again, you're fighting against the natural thing like the guy who's the best at this takes a topic and spends 20 minutes on it and you're playing the the super high wire game of i'm gonna spend two hours on this thing you know and that's that's a lot of seconds for someone to potentially click away onto something else and then youtube looks at that and says oh people only watched a third of the way into the video. So like, why would you recommend this to people if they don't get to the end? Like, uh uh-oh, now your video is going to have a bad time and you've only done four in a year. This episode of Cortex is brought to you by FitBod. Between balancing your work life, your family life, and everything else you've got going on, it can be hard to make fitness a priority. What you need is a program that will work with you, not against you, and that's why you need FitBod. FitBod has an incredibly cool algorithm that will learn about you and your goals and your ability to train. It's going to craft a personalized exercise plan that is unique to you, and their app makes it incredibly easy to learn exactly how to perform every exercise with their awesome HD video tutorials. They're shot from multiple angles. This makes sure that your learning each exercise will be super simple. It's going to be a breeze because you can see exactly how it's done. And then once you've learned how to do it, it's really easy to use your Apple Watch or your Wear a smartwatch to advance through the exercises. You don't need to check at your phone, which I also really enjoy personally, so that I could be like focused on what I'm doing. So you've got that mixture. You can use their app to help you learn, but once you know, you're good to go. Personal fitness isn't about competing with others. If you look to people and try and do what they're doing, it's not going to stick for you. You need something that is supposed to work directly for you, with you, alongside you. And that is what FitBod does. It uses data to create and adjust a dynamic fitness plan for you. You'll have instant access to your own personalized routine right in the app. So you're able to make progress on your goals from anywhere because everybody's fitness path is different. This is why FitBod does all of this work to make sure they customize your path for you. 
FitBod learns from your last workout, so your next will be even better, whether you work out twice a day or twice a week. And it even tracks your muscle recovery to make sure your plan is balanced for a variety of exercises to make sure you're not overworking anything. Personalized training of this quality can be expensive, but FitBod is just $12.99 a month or $79.99 a year. But you can get 25% off your membership today by going to fitbod.me slash cortex. So go now and get your customized fitness plan at fitbod.me slash cortex and you will get 25% of your membership. That's fitbod.me slash cortex for 25% off. Our thanks to FitBod for the support of this show and Relay FM. One of the things that I latched on to this video and I think many other people did because I think it's the real beauty of this video, is the three-in-one kind of idea, where you've got three kind of distinct videos going on inside of this video, to Mm -hmm. the point where you, I think, quite masterfully, I will say, and my hat is off to you, the secret gray video inside with like the set being built. (laughs) When that set started building itself, I was like, God damn it, that's smart. You So bravo to you there. But what was going on with this? Like, why this? Why this three-in-one-ness? Why not three videos? Like, why did you do it this way? So after a video has been out for a while, even though I've been looking at statistics more now, one of the things that YouTube's had around for a really long time that I have always looked at is the graph of audience retention. And they have a much more useful version of it, which is called like relative audience attention, which is basically a line. And it says, compared to every other video on YouTube, which is this same length, how many people are still watching at a particular moment, Uh. which I think is way more useful than the curve that everyone seems to want to talk about, which is just percent of viewers still watching at moment. I didn't even know that that existed, that graph. That sounds better. Yeah, it's like a much better indicator of... Like, I want to know where people are interested and where are they not. And that graph, in my experience, really matches up with, I don't know, is is scenes the right word? But like in a video, you have little sections where you're talking, like we're talking about this and now we're talking about this. And I feel like the relative audience retention graph matches up really well with where the scenes are. Like you Mm -hmm. can kind of see when a scene starts and when a scene ends. And so I think one thing I've gotten better at over the years in making videos by looking at that little graph is in some of my older videos, I would have a really big drop off when people would stop watching. And it was only after the video had gone up, I could look at it and say, oh, I didn't realize, but at this moment I was changing topics. Like we started talking about a thing and then I lose a bunch of people here because suddenly we're, we're like talking about something that's related or it's not quite the main thing. We're going to get back to the main thing, but we're on a little, a little bit of a diversion over here. My expectation is that's just when it gets too complicated for people and they, they leave. Yeah, I think sometimes that can be the case. I think there are other ones. I can't think of a video off the top of my head, but it's where it's just like, oh, now we're talking about something that's related but not the same, which is just different from complicated. It's just like, oh, this video is now moving in a different direction. I feel like I'm just talking for myself here. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, I don't understand anymore. (laughs) (laughs) I don't don't think that's the case, Mike. But uh, like as a viewer as well, when you're watching something, you can sometimes feel those moments of like, oh, wait, what are we doing now? Like, why are we talking about this? So I think over many years, I've gotten better at doing that less of narrowing the focus and keeping the video like on point right what is this about this is about which planet is the most is closest and like boom we're gonna we're gonna stick on this and like i think my graphs have gotten smoother about not losing people during particular sections but so with this video it kind of started when i was talking to my parents back when i was visiting them and we were talking about runways and airplanes my mom's a former flight attendant so this stuff comes up all the time somehow it came up about like oh the runway numbers like how do they come up and so we started looking into it (laughs) what are you laughing at there mike your time with your family is very different to my time with my family i i get the impression whenever i tell people stuff like this (laughs) i don't think this is what normal families do i don't think people are sitting around and they're like let's look into why (laughs) to why there are numbers uh on runways is that not how that goes (laughs) 
<laughs> I don't think that that is a normal. Do you not have the thing where someone is going to be Googling and then they airplay to the TV in front of everyone so everyone can watch the Googling as, we, and as we're trying create to create a PowerPoint presentation? A, 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 that's how it works in my family. Hey, look, <laughs> I'm not surprised, uh-huh. but I don't think, I'm not sure. I mean, I would like to know if people's family lives are like this, but. Uh, and no, mine isn't. So anyway, as families do, as they you're do, collectively yeah. Googling to try to find the answer to a thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so we like we found, obviously, a bunch of... It's, like, it's not like actually it's some kind of crazy secret, right? It's a well-known piece of information. But what I found really interesting and one of the reasons why the topic stuck with me is that they all stopped after explaining, like, oh, this is the magnetic heading. <laughs> like, but surely the most interesting thing about this is that the magnetic pole moves. They all stopped in their explanations before they got to that point. And so when I was working on the video, I kept thinking about, okay, I want to do this, but if I'm going to do it, this is a time where there 100% has to be a topic change in the middle of the video. Mm Mm-hmm. Originally, I didn't want to have anything to do with physics. Uh, There was only supposed to be one topic change. But, you know, so this this but this was like the dawn of this video is there has to be a topic change. And so I thought, okay, the moment I realized like this can really work as a video is if you do the reverse, instead of trying to get rid of topic changes, acknowledge the fact that there is a topic change and just really lean into Mm -hmm. it. And that's when it was like, here's the idea of the video within a video. And so over the scripts, we kind of built on that and like made it bigger and bigger each time. But that was actually the whole reason for it was was kind of like an audience retention thing of it's much more interesting if I very explicitly acknowledge we're like starting over with another topic. This is part of the reason why before publication, I was extremely concerned that this video could just totally bomb. Right. Because I thought like, if it doesn't work, I've introduced two moments that basically guarantee the audience can leave now, where they go like, I don't care at all about this. Because if you work backwards from what you're doing back to your insight, right? Like you can take, you can draw a different path, right? You're like, I know that topic changes, like accidental topic changes can result in people leaving at this point you have nothing to tell you that purposeful topic changes will produce a different result yeah in fact if anything it may make it worse oh yeah yeah it may make it way worse now again i've obviously i made the video because i thought Oh, I think we can do this in a way where it does work. Mm-hmm. I, I think it can it can be better this way. But I could have been wrong. <laughs> like it's That's very I mean, easy right? to like, be wrong. You go back to the insight, <laughs> and like yes, you've drawn a conclusion, but there's nothing to say that that was the right move. And also, like there's nothing to say that this would work again. Yeah. Yeah. Yet, uh, right. Like yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, look, there's there's a reason why in ten years I've done this once mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. it happens to work well in this way. It's also why like the script is funny to me where like Greg keeps saying like, oh, th- this isn't a physics video is because that was also my personal experience. It's like, God damn it. I really don't want to talk about the fi- yeah. like I think this magic trick can work once yeah. of there's a video in the video. But I ended up making it like, oh, God, we do it twice. And I was really concerned because I think like that last third, part of the reason I re-recorded it, like it's better now, but it's still, it's still like the slowest part of the video. And even just like in everyday life, when people find out that you've done physics, they're often kind of repelled, right? And they let you know, right? Like people will just straight up tell you like, oh, I hated physics, (laughs) right? Like... You know, I, I still will always remember one of my doctors while he was giving me an injection and it came up about me having physics. He's like, I did really bad in my physics classes. And it's like, dude, that is not what I want to hear right now. <laughs> you don't um, tell me you d- did anything other than perfect in every science. Yeah. Right? Well, especially <laughs> when you have a needle in <laughs> my arm. That's what I mean, right? right? While it's you're like, performing so, like some kind it's of... It's an injection, right? Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> you're performing some kind of medical thing on me. I just yeah. want you to tell me you, you were aced everything. Yeah. It's like, you don't, you don't want your anesthesiologist to be telling you he didn't do great on his kinematics test and it's like (laughs) nope dude that's not what i want to hear so people are like real vocal about i did bad in physics and i hate it right which is one of these things that you just find out if you have a degree in physics and it ever comes up so that's why i was really worried about the last third of it. the payoff was good though you set it up well right like 
I was excited when the physics part started because you told me how much you didn't want to do it. Like the, the writing of it was good, even though, as I said to you beforehand, that was the part that I just did not understand. Right. And like I, 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 I enjoyed the watching of it, but that part I didn't get it. It just went over my head. That happens to me with those kinds of topics anyway. Any, you know. I just want to be clear here for you and for the viewers. There's a reason that I often haven't done physics stuff. And this moment here where you're like, oh, I don't understand that section. That is not your fault because the actual explanation that I have given is not an adequate explanation of right. why is this occurring. So I, I think like this is just a problem, especially in a lot of science communication where you can explain something in the simplest way that's possible, but I think you can often end up being more confused by the simple explanation than you would be by the raw explanation. Okay. It's just that the raw explanation takes more time. Because I guess with the simple explanation, you're just being told, right? Yeah, you're being told. You don't have the opportunity to come to it on your own or like you're not given the tools to be able to work it out, right? You just, this is true, believe it. So like there's a thing in the video where I talk about like, okay, because the world is spinning, it makes these coils of current rotate their position. Mm -hmm. The way I say it in the video, I'm kind of expecting that for some viewers, they have a little bit of an intuitive sense that that's what happens. Like, oh, if you spin something this way, like a thing moves in an opposite direction. But tons of people won't have that intuitive sense. And there's no reason that they would. And I'm just saying twice that this is a thing that happens. So when you when you hear it the second time, it's not like it's a trick, but I'm partly relying on the fact of we've been through this before, right? We talked about this earlier, that when the Earth spins it causes these trade winds to happen. And so now, later in the video, when the Earth spins, it causes these coils to rotate into the position that they're supposed to be, just like what happens with the wind before. But if you pause for a second, you go, hey, yeah, wait a minute, but like, why, right? Yeah. Why does it rotate in this different direction? The answer there is like, well, we would have to talk about rotational inertia. Like, I, we could explain this. But now the video needs to be an hour long in order to <laughs> This is to how you get that. to four-hour YouTube videos. <laughs> right. This is how you get to a four-hour YouTube yeah. video. I don't know. I feel quite passionate about this because this is going back to my time as a physics teacher. There was a thing that I always found really frustrating with GCSE physics in the UK where there's a lot of times where they were like the curriculum as, as mandated was trying to make some physics things simple. But by making them simple, I could see that it routinely tripped up the smarter kids in the class, right? Because they could tell that like something's not right here or something hasn't been fully explained mm -hmm. here. And like it was a very frequent pattern that's like, OK, by making this simple, you've actually made it harder for the kids who you most want to get into this topic. Because they, they can feel like, wait, but you haven't actually explained something. I feel like I, in school I was always repelled by the it just is topics. So it's like I got to a point in in maths and I was like, I can't. Like when we get to like algebra and stuff like that, it was just like, I can't, I can't conceive of this. Like I don't, it doesn't make any sense to me that I couldn't see the logic in it. And I have no doubt that it's there, but it just wasn't taught to me. Math is a... a horrifying special case because th th that actually is at the very bottom of math is like well it just is we actually just defined the system this way and you could okay. define math to be any way that you wanted it to be right is the is the ultimate answer yeah uh, it is like oh we only happen to use this subset of math that works out for the real world mm -hmm. but yes at the bottom of math is like this isn't actually connected to anything real in any actual way is the, is the true horrifying answer. Mm. So yeah, m math is particularly weird with that. But yeah, so, so all of this is to say like, if you watch that section, that's the physics section, and you say like, oh, I don't get this part, I think you're correct. Right. Ultimately, I have not adequately explained what is really occurring in that section. But that's by design. It's not by design, it's just by, by practicality of it. Right, but that's what I mean. Like you, you have you've made a decision, right? That like this is not going to be a thirty-seven minute video. 
Yeah. This is this is also why I avoided that section because I know I'm ultimately going to have to push up against these little parts where you're mm-hmm. saying like, okay, look, we're not we're not going to explain rotational inertia. There's all sorts of things in there where it's like we're just not going to explain them and we're going to have to move on. Now, like part of the reason that I think that that section does work and I and I was happy to leave it in is because this this idea in some ways is I think something that you can take from that section even if the mechanics of like, wait, how does the earth have a magnetic field? Doesn't quite yeah. make sense. You can still take from it like, hey, if you keep asking why questions, you're going to get to the bottom of the universe and why means nothing here. That's actually the answer to all of your questions. So I'm happy to have that section in there because I think that there still is something else to to get out of it. But it is the section that I was worried the most about for a lot of different reasons. And, and one of them is like, oh, it's just not possible to adequately explain this. And even the simple explanation, which is blowing past a lot of stuff, it's still long. Like there's still a lot to get through in that whole part. So yeah, I didn't want to have it put in there. Right up until the 11th hour, I kept thinking it was a mistake to have that section in there. And it was really only in the last couple of days before upload where I finally got happy with it and thought, okay, even if this video bombs... I will be content with feeling like it wasn't because the last section was terrible. Like I got it to a place where I was happy with it and thought I will put this up and we'll see how it goes. Many opportunities for a viewer to click away in a three in one structure. I feel like Mm. it was a, that was a high risk move. And there is a alternate universe gray who is like crying into his microphone right now because the video is just watched by no one because they were clicking away and it didn't work. Like it, it could have easily gone in a different direction. If you point the microphone down towards you, less likelihood of the crying into. Right. The, the tears don't fall into the microphone. So once again, above. If you're a sad podcaster, you want to go up pointing down. It's good advice. Listen to Mike for his microphone advice. This episode of Cortex is brought to you by Sourcegraph. So you've hired a brilliant developer. That's great, but now you have to get them onboarded. If your company is growing, onboarding new developers will be a common occurrence, but it's a big undertaking each time. One of the biggest challenges for new hires is to get up to speed with the project that their new team's working on. This can be tricky if the code base is that your developers are working in are already large. Thankfully, Sourcegraph makes it easy to move fast even in those big code bases. Developers know that knowledge is most useful when it's findable. Centralization is helpful, but given the fact that most companies store knowledge in at least two different locations, how do you make knowledge accessible to those that need it? As a code intelligence platform, Sourcegraph gives developers what they need to drive their own learning over time and in different situations. Teams without Sourcegraph need to rely on asking colleagues or reviewing out-of-date documentation, which is cumbersome and time-consuming. But with Sourcegraph, every developer can search across millions of repositories to find specific code, saving time for themselves and everyone else. So when questions do come up, you know it's the big stuff worthy of the extra time. Sourcegraph was created to make developers' lives easier, and today they work with leading companies across every industry, including three out of the five top tech companies, plus PayPal, Uber, Plaid, GE, Reddit, and Atlassian. Visit about.sourcegraph.com to learn more. That's about.sourcegraph.com to find out what some of the biggest tech companies in the world use Sourcegraph and to see what it can do for yours. Or you could just click the link in our show notes to let them know that you heard about them from us. Our thanks to Sourcegraph for the support of this show and Relay FM. Let's do some Ask Cortex questions. Okay. What uh, tickles your fancy? Not because I have a good answer, but just because I think it's funny. Tony here wants to know, how many secret projects do you have at this moment? Oh, that's a good question. This is like a perpetually differing thing, depending uh-huh. on time of the year. And so here's the second subset questions I have here, so we can try and define this. Personal projects, mm-hmm. primary business projects, secondary business projects, right? Mm-hmm. So like primary being YouTube for you, Relay for me, secondary being for both of us, Cortex brand. Just the way that you feel like, oh man, I've got to really start getting out all these categories for all my secret projects tells me you have a lot of secret projects going on. No, I'm just like seeing like these are the areas we're going to talk about, right? Because I have two secret personal projects that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. So I just was wondering if personal was going to be in the top secret project 
categories. I'm, w- I'm wondering what your secret personal projects are. I'm trying to think about what they We were be. talking about one of them today. The other one we have spoken about, but it's probably not coming into your mind. Right. Uh, so we've got two personal secret projects. Some Mike's pottery lessons. You know, I did. That wasn't it. But like, did I tell you we went and did another one in London? Like we found no, you the didn't London tell me studio, that. And we did. And it was awesome. It was so good. <laughs> and I, once I actually get secret project one out of the way, that mm-hmm. is... I, I need to get back to that. All right. It was so good. Oh, my God. I love it so much. I would say I have one Relay Secret project, mm-hmm. which is way fewer than normal mm-hmm. because I'm trying to you know, structure it, right? Just calm all of that down. Cortex brand. I feel like there's two in Cortex. Well, I was going to say Maybe four. Three. Okay, right. Because, but they're inv- like you've got from a case of like, Secret Project 1 currently in manufacturing. Mm-hmm. Secret Project 2 is like the next one. And then yeah, three, you know what up. I mean? Yeah, of yeah. like, they're just like things that we haven't started, but we know we want to do. Yeah, that, that's what I was thinking. There's Secret Project in manufacturing, and then there's Secret Project next up. That's what yeah. I was thinking of for two. But I know of like our next three things that I want mm. to work on. I don't know if they're going to be the next three things that we do. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's me. What about you? Uh, I mean, yeah. So I've got the Cortex secret projects, obviously. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we share. Those. It's funny because I, I really just wanted to quickly say to Tony is like, "Nice try, Tony." Or I try to find out the secrets. Yeah. But I, I think the actuality of it is that today, personally, right now, in terms of what I'm up to, aside from the Cortex stuff, I don't have any secret projects, and that is solely because I'm in that weird transition window where the video has gone up, but I have not decided what the next project is going to be i was playing around with some possibilities this morning of like trying to scry around and feel like what's what's soon what should Mm -hmm. be later like what should i work on this is actually part of new decades dawn is trying to be much more deliberate before i switch to the next thing so i technically currently have no secret projects because i haven't settled on like okay this is the next video and i'm gonna gonna work on that so Currently none. I'm giving you full control today over the question picking. No, I, I don't want that kind of pressure. Um, oh, okay, so here's an interesting one. This is from Lewis. What was the last thing you have learned from zero? So, like, an example, learning to play an instrument without knowing anything about music. Is this something you do often? No. Mm-hmm. What I will say for this one is soldering. Oh, that's that's actually, that's a good one. I would say in the time of my life right now, I have the feeling more of wanting to learn things for the sake and fun of learning them. What what do you mean? Not to do anything with it. Oh, okay. Like there's just stuff I want to learn. Like right now, I've just been learning more about coffee, even though I haven't actually actioned it or not necessarily want to action it. I just want, I'm just interested in the information. Hmm. But soldering is the thing that that I feel like I've learned from zero uh, most recently Mm -hmm. to the point where like I now consider it a skill that I have Mm. and and I've done enough variants of it and like weird things like drag soldering, which is like a whole other subset of it. And I've done this a couple of times to the point where I feel confident that like if you sit me down and be like, can you solder this? I know what to do. What is drag soldering? I've never heard of that before. It's you have to use a different compound where you use it soldering solder has something called flux in it, which is like kind of like a wax. And Mm -hmm. I don't I'll be honest, I don't know what it actually does. I think it like helps the spread of the solder and it's like to contain it. It's where like if you have pins, like flat pins, Mm -hmm. where you have to solder a bunch of them at once. Like imagine like on a USB connector or something. So like if to solder a USB connector to a board, rather than it being like a one-to-one point that you're soldering together with wire, they're like all these little points that you have, that contact pads that have to touch each other. Hmm. So this is where you apply a bunch of the flux stuff that when you then actually apply the solder wire, it pulls around the contact areas as opposed to around the surrounding area. So if you're if you're soldering something that's really tiny, 
it gives you kind of like a, a freedom. Oh, okay. I'm hmm. I know I'm doing a very bad job explaining this, so I will find a YouTube video to put in the show notes. So if you're listening to me being like, Mike, you don't know how to explain this, <laughs> yes, I don't know how to explain this, but I'm just trying my best. So it gives you a lot of it gives you some leeway basically to apply sorta to things that are very tiny that would otherwise be really, really hard to do. Hmm. This was very intimidating to me because it was nothing like what I'd learned. But I did it and it worked. You know, and mm. I've done sorting of very tiny components and larger components. So like I feel like especially around keyboard stuff now, if it's just like you've got to sort of this like it's like, yeah, I can work this out. And I've gotten to the point with it where I understand that even though this seems like very complex and daunting technology, it's actually like one of the more basic kind of brutal kind of ways of dealing with technology. <laughs> where like you you do not have to be perfect to get yeah. this to work. You can be very clumsy and get it to work. Yeah. <laughs> and I kind of like that about it. Yeah. So soldering is pretty forgiving as far as these things go. Yeah. It's genuinely <laughs> one of the things I love about it. You can be really messy and really bad, but mm-hmm. it can still work because like, can. it's very forgiving, I find. You must have this sort of time though, right? Learning things from zero. Well, so no. Like... I would just assume that you'd consider this part of your job. I feel like you have an answer there, which is what this question is trying to get at, which is like a skill, right? On your character sheet, like what skills do you have listed? Mm-hmm. Solder, sol, soldering, sol, I always have a hard time saying it. Ice, terrible. Yeah. Soldering, soldering? Soldering. I've always, I've always had, because it's also like the way it is in my head is not the way that it's written on the page. Also, I believe in the UK it is soldering. Is that okay? Right. right? So... But I only ever really hear Americans say it like from when I was learning. And so I say soldering. Yeah. And that is one of these things that I say to British people. And they're like, what are you saying? What's wrong <laughs> yeah. with you? You know? Yeah. So, so soldering is yeah. a skill that you have on a sheet. Like it's a thing that you can do. Hey, my keyboard's broken. You can fix it. Yeah. I feel like that's what this question is kind of getting at. So I draw a very strong distinction between learning how to and learning about and i think what most okay. people do most of the time is that they learn about a thing and learning how to is a way smaller section of what people spend time learning so i feel like the spirit of this question is a how to question it's not about so i don't regard anything that i've done in terms of the videos like that right this is learning about it's not learning how to Honestly, probably the like the closest thing I would have as an answer to this question is streaming. Is like I learned how to stream. Did you? <laughs> it's my. I was, I was did like, you? I know Mike's gonna give me a really hard time. About this, which I, I, like, I dr- try to bring it up, but I genuinely think that's like the closest how to in a long time. No, you, you know how to do it. Most of the time it's the, the technology that you use is is creating a, a bad environment for you. Yeah. I was trying to think about like the closest thing earlier to that that I could think of is, I mean, this is years ago now, but I was teaching myself how to edit videos with Adobe Premiere instead of using Final Cut when I was a little bit worried that Final Cut was just abandonware. Yeah. And Apple has totally turned that around in the best of all possible ways. So. But prior to streaming, I think like that's the closest and that does not count as from zero because I already had a ton of concepts in my head about video editing. I would say streaming is a good one, though, because it's not just a technical thing. It's not just a practical thing. There's like a mentality to it. Yeah. That like you really displayed in the Minecraft streams those days of yore. That felt like that feels like forever ago when yeah. you were streaming Minecraft and like calling out your subs and stuff, you know? Yeah, there there is a whole mindset of it, which I, I do still feel like I haven't quite gotten fully, but it, but it is a kind of skill. There's ways to obviously do it badly and there's ways to do it better. Mm-hmm. But I just want to mention here, it's worth thinking about that. It should be true in the arc of your life that you do way more of learning how to at the beginning and way less at toward the end. Basically, this is called like an explore exploit algorithm where you have a computer program and and you're trying to figure out like, oh, you want to get a bunch of resources out of a particular area. How much time do you spend exploring versus how much time do you spend exploiting a known resource? I feel like the example that's usually used is like squirrels finding trees that have lots of nuts in them. Like how much time do you spend exploring new trees? How much time do you spend exploiting trees where you found nuts? And this is like the course of a human career, right? You, You spend time 
exploring at the beginning, but you should spend the vast majority of your time exploiting the tools and abilities that you have found and developed. I think that that's useful to keep in mind because it can kind of be a weird transition when you leave school or a couple of years into your career. Like, I think a lot of people do get that feeling of like, oh, I haven't learned anything new or I haven't learned any brand new skills from zero. And I'm not saying that like the number of skills you should pick up should be zero, Mm -hmm. but you should spend the vast majority of your time like exploiting the pre-existing skills that you have. And you shouldn't necessarily feel guilty for like not picking up a bunch of new ones, which is why I can say like very comfortably like streaming barely counts as a new skill. And if we skip past that one, it's like my list of new how to's in a real meaningful way is like very thin for a long time. And I'm perfectly fine with that because I feel like I'm exploiting a bunch of skills that I have already developed and have. And I just think that's useful to think about in terms of how careers and how life goes. Pick another one. No, you have to pick one now. I picked no, two. Yeah, I picked two control. in a row. Remember, Mike. Full control. Full control. Full control. I, don't, yeah. I, I didn't ask for. Why do I look? I've never had full control in a Q and A before. Like this is ridiculous. What do you mean you don't have full control in a Q and A? If I ask you a question you don't want to answer, you say I'm not going to answer that. That's full control. No, that's veto power. <laughs> Isn't veto power technically full control? I, I, I feel like there's some subtle differences here. <laughs> but isn't the end result the same? Yes, the end result is the same. That's yeah. true. <laughs> it's, it's 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 full control while like leaning back in a chair. That's what veto power is. Yeah. No, no, no. Come on, pick another one. <laughs> okay. Um. Oh, I can actually just answer this one really quickly. Uh, Adam wants to know: Have either of you heard of or used the Remarkable tablet? Mm. Have you come across that one, Mike? I mean, I'm on Instagram, so I get the ads every day. Oh, is that is this like a big Instagram thing? I don't know if it's like they advertise to me personally very aggressively. <laughs> like I, I get served ads for the Remarkable a lot. The Remarkable is a e ink tablet. There's a pen. You can take notes on it. You can read on it, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Are you tempted at all? I'm intrigued. You're intrigued. But, yes. But I'm not three, four hundred pounds intrigued. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I went to a conference and I, I sat next to a guy who was using one. I'd never seen or heard of it before. Uh-huh. Apparently, I, I don't spend enough time on Instagram. <laughs> and of course, this poor person sitting next to me, I was like, what is that? And explain everything about yeah. it to me. Because <laughs> yep. it looks really cool. Like, it's very interesting to see. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, it's a Kindle you can write on. That's amazing. I was really impressed with the latency. It did way better than I would have expected an e-ink screen to do. There was a lot of things that were really cool about it. I was extremely intrigued, but for me, the falling down part is just sinking back out. Like, how do you get things out of here that you have worked on? Okay. And it's not that they didn't have a bunch of options, but none of them would line up with the way that I would need or want them to work. So, Well, what do you want? Look, Mike, that's a very complicated question we're not going to get into right now. I mean, like, because they say they've added support for, like, Dropbox and Google Drive and stuff. Yes, I, yes, I understand that. Th- this is why I think for anyone who's intrigued by it, it probably would be a good idea. But I'm looking for very particular things with the way that I'm working with my scripts and how those scripts are syncing and also with multiple people. So like, I just have a much more complicated problem that this can't solve in its current form. Somebody's built Obsidian integration. Uh, okay, so this is getting closer, <laughs> but still like... <laughs> Again, look, Mike, this is just like, we don't need to talk about rotational inertia in a video. Like, we don't need to talk about the exact details of what it is that I'm trying to do. Okay, this is one of those things where Mike is personally intrigued, right? (laughs) Not about, like, do I think this is interesting content? Uh Because, look, I am very interested by this thing. And, like, Mm -hmm. I don't know. But for me, it's like, I don't know what I would use it for. This is the reason that I've never progressed, right? Yeah. Because I don't use my Apple Pencil or my iPad enough, I feel like, right? Mm -hmm. So the reason I put this in a document is I was interested if you have ever considered it for like script annotation stuff. Oh, yeah. That that is 100% what I would want to use it for. The problem is, I don't know, this is more like state of the apps later in the year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's the workflow that I want is I want to... 
export a PDF of the document that I'm working on in Obsidian, the current script. Mm -hmm. And then I want to take that PDF and mark it up. Mm -hmm. So even just like with my iPad, right? I just want to mm -hmm. mark it up with the iPad. I then want to send that PDF to my assistant who will make all of the changes on the text file the PDF was generated from. And that's the part where it, it fails. There's no good way to give her access to the Obsidian files that I'm working on that also allows Obsidian to sync between all of my devices without also giving her, what is the current state of it? I think I would need to give her the entire Obsidian database, which I just don't want to do for many reasons because it's just like this horrific spider web of thousands of documents that can go wrong. <laughs> like, it's, Yeah, because it's like it's, it's, Obsidian is an app for hoarders. Well, Mike, I think that's a little bit unfair. No, I don't think it's unfair at all. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's just like, it's way too high stakes for something to go wrong at this point. I'm lost as why is this a problem with the Remarkable? Well, because the Remarkable has the same issue of, ultimately, it's not the issue of marking it up. The thing that's actually the problem is getting the corrections back into my system. So it doesn't have anything to do with how am I marking the thing up. It's right now, it's extremely clunky to get changes back into Obsidian. That's where the issue is. But isn't that a problem no matter what you use? Yes, exactly. But that's why I'm saying, like, I don't do this enough because there's a different problem. If I was able to solve this different problem, the Remarkable might totally work for me and I would use it. Okay. But I can't get that last, like, how does she make changes on a text document in my Obsidian without also having access to the entire Obsidian. Right. Like, I just want her to have access to a subsection of the f files. I feel stupid here. Yeah? Because I, I feel like I'm getting lost or something. How are you currently doing it, then? Currently, this is, this is the whole thing, I would like to do this way more, but I've only done it a handful of times in mm. the last two years because it's so much of a pain in the butt. And when we do it, it's by manually copying the text file for her to edit and then i'm like copy pasting back the text file into my own system okay. which is just it's not good we also run into because often the text editing is being done in a windows system there's slightly different encoding systems for text files between yeah. windows and here so it's like it's almost exactly formatted the way I like everything formatted, but not quite, which is an annoying distraction when I'm then going to re-edit the file itself. There's just like a thousand little tiny things. You should use Craft. <sighs> this is not state of the apps, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but we've got months before we do that. Because if you used Craft, they could edit it on the web. Or even Google Docs. Like, why don't you use Google Docs? Because I, wa I, I want the script... Okay, look, I have been thinking about maybe breaking this for this part. The question is, do I separate out the scripts from all of the other documents in Obsidian? I think once you've gotten to a script, to a point where like this script is ready for others to see, it has to leave the siloed application. No, it doesn't have to leave the siloed application. Yes, it does. I have, I ha no, I haven't had it been leaving the siloed application. Well, like, no it can one's stay, looking at no, it, are it they? It can stay right in there, right? It's perfectly fine. Right, but then I, it's like, just you, <laughs> right? You can right. keep it in there, but then yeah. no one can look at it. Right, exactly. What, what, I'm saying, it, what this is a choice you need to make. Do you want other people to look at them? Uh, no, I know, I know. But this is, the whole, this is the whole reason that I moved to Obsidian in the first place, is there are big advantages from my perspective while working on projects to have scripts and notes in the same place. And like this. <laughs> but why does it need to like, okay. At the moment where you've decided somebody else needs to see this, can't you just like offboard it to a thing? And then when it's done, bring it back. That is what we are currently doing. Right. But it is a real pain. It's just, it's very annoying to do. It slows down things. It introduces weird text encoding problems as well. well. Maybe Obsidian's the wrong app. You know what I mean? No, but you still listen. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so look, this is look. This is my this is my one problem with my current system. Is and, and also like I know full well my use case here is crazy niche. So like I'm not expecting. I don't think anyone. so at all. 
You don't think this is <sighs> what collaboration on a document? That's no, not. That's like the no, core. No, the way no, the way you're framing that there is getting is blowing past all of the important things. Is collaboration on a document in Obsidian, but only a small section of the Obsidian no, vault, not the whole no, thing. I don't think this is wild at all. This seems like a very valid use case for me that somebody has a document in their Obsidian. You call it a vault. I, I assume that's what they're called then. Yeah, it just means the folder with all the stuff. That they want to share with someone to work on, but Mm -hmm. doesn't want to give them full access to their Obsidian. So all of the links are removed from what the person views. I don't know. This seems pretty obvious to me. I I don't (laughs) imagine it's easy to build, but (laughs) considering this thing is mostly web technologies, like seems possible that because all of these things exist on the web, Uh, right? It's obscured, but it's on the web. Yeah, I mean, and again, part of the issue here is that Obsidian's big selling feature is that it is your files on your computer. It, like, it's not like a Google Docs, right? It's not where everything is in the web. It's very specifically local syncing of all of your files. This is why it gets more. We don't need right, to talk about They have about a sync system, this. though, right? Or is it just sync and changes? Because they have Obsidian Sync, right? What is that doing then? They do have Obsidian Sync. I'm under the impression that they're just syncing changes there. Okay. I could be wrong. Right, but you could, in theory, though, share... Uh-huh. Oh, but you don't want to share the Dropbox thing with someone. Well, okay, so Obsidian, uh, when they moved, when they rolled out the Obsidian sync, they deprecated Dropbox as a syncing option. So the two options for syncing are iCloud or the Obsidian sync system. Not And I- iCloud doesn't let you go like, hey, I want to let someone have access to this one subfolder uh, inside this whole thing. I mean, th- honestly, if that's the case, then I feel like with Obsidian sync, there should be a way for somebody to be able to collaborate. Like That, that should be a thing that they should work on. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll add it to the feature request then. I'll, yeah. I'll put that on there. But I, I, ju- I just it's feel gotta like... It's got to be something that they've heard a billion times, like that people want collaboration. Mm-hmm. I'm not convinced, because you know why, Mike? Obsidian is an application for individual weirdo hoarders who all have their own crazy system and it's just like everything about the app seems anti a bunch of people yeah, working i mean on it. I, I just search collaboration on the forum and there's lots of posts about people wanting collaboration hmm. it has okay. been labeled as a valuable feature request apparently whatever that means <laughs> it's like that that sounds like a no thanks uh kind of comment right well we'll consider your feature request but yeah i don't know like i feel like <laughs> of a text editing thing these days collaboration is important mm-hmm. that's why like i thought of craft right like i know mm-hmm. craft is different i know but i know it also has some overlaps with what obsidian does like yeah, the yeah. linking between notes and stuff and craft is very good at the collaboration to the point of like you can share an entire database with somebody or every note you can create a collaborative version for Mm -hmm. on the web and it's awesome Hmm. because i mean i use it and i've used it with you right like i keep all of the cortex brand stuff in craft and i've shared with you um, and with uh, your assistant some notes and their secret note links only available like in a kind of a google docs way to people that have the url Mm -hmm. and then i can choose if they can update it or not that stuff they're like pushing further into it hmm. i feel like obsidian's got to get on that train because if they don't i don't know i feel like someone's going to come along and take it from them because it seems i don't know it just if you're making if you have people writing their magnum opuses inside of this application i just feel like the ability to share a document with somebody else i don't know it seems pretty important mm-hmm. But this has got nothing to do with the remarkable. <laughs> all of this has got nothing to do with the remarkable at all. Right. But that's why I'm saying it's like I'm intrigued by the remarkable, but I have a different problem that like precedes right, you, even getting it, right? Yeah, Otherwise, you, yeah, but there's you no must point be in having doing it. something. Like the, the, the script markup is not not happening because of this. It is happening way less frequently than it should be happening. Right? Hmm. The, like the, the friction of this has made it like, oh, okay, I'll do this once on each of the scripts now. Yeah, I feel like you should be taking the completed draft out of Obsidian, putting it somewhere that's shareable, and then having a better <sighs> flow. Yes, no, I, I understand. I understand. I like, I'll, look, I just want to get into all the. I, I will just argue that the, the advantage of having it all in one place mm-hmm. is that it is not always as clear as you might imagine when something is a script and when something is not a script. And so being able to jump around between different things in the same application 
is really useful. Yeah, sure. I would say at the point that you feel like you want to share it with someone, that's the point that it needs to leave because the application that you've gone all in on that's now failing you doesn't allow <sighs> for collaboration. So I feel like at the point where you're like, oh, assistant or fact checker would be good to see this document, well, then it should leave Obsidian because <sighs> Obsidian can't do that. It's like it's a Sami knife, but it's lost the corkscrew or something, you know? I know that you're right, and I don't want you to be right. (laughs) (laughs) This is fun for me. I wasn't expecting this to be the conversation that came out of, have you tried the e-ink tablet? (laughs) I just wanted to say, oh, I've seen it. It looks cool, but it's not for me. I've seen it, and I think it looks cool, but I don't have a use for it. For me, where this would be incredibly useful is if they could do something that is no way they could possibly do it, which is let me mark up Kindle books. Like, they have EPUBs. Right, mm. but not Kindle books. If Amazon made this thing, I would be more interested. Right? Yeah. Because if I'm buying a, an ebook, I'm I'm getting a Kindle book. Like that's yeah. just because I'm just in on that. Right? Like, of course, this is what I'm, this is Amazon's whole thing. I'm intrigued by it. You know, like the things that that I will. This is not going to feel like paper and pen, right? Like everyone tries to say these things feel like paper and pen. They don't feel like paper and pen. It might feel better. It, I'm sure it feel more like it, but it's not going to feel like it, right? Like mm-hmm. it's not going to feel like writing on a glass screen because it isn't a glass screen. Mm-hmm. Um, so that might feel nicer, but you know, they call it a paper-like surface. It definitely doesn't have a paper-like surface. It will have mm-hmm. just like a matte surface, which would be different to a glass surface. And I believe them that I bet it's, much much easier to read in sunlight because there's no backlight so that's funny they sort of say no glare or backlight as like a pro it's also a con it means yeah. <laughs> you can't see it if it's dark right like like i'm sure that it's nice for you if you are sitting by the by the pool and reading but if you're in a dimly lit room well i'm sorry this isn't going to work for you anymore i think you should get one of these and solve your sinking problem these are two separate things by the way getting one of these doesn't solve your sinking problem I'll look into that. 